On today's World Inside, a constructive meeting between ranking Chinese and U.S. officials in Zurich with an understanding to keep communication lines open, an icebreaker in frosty relations, a 2021 Nobel laureate for a study on human skin receptors for touch and temperature, the mentor of an eminent Chinese scholar, insights on the Nobel-winning research from Professor Xiao Bai Long a biochemist at Tsinghua University, and a reckoning on the true costs in lives and limb of America's longest 20-year war in Afghanistan, the brutal lessons of foreign military intervention. Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Let's begin today's program with word from a meeting of senior Chinese and U.S. officials in Switzerland. China and the U.S. agreed to take action to bring bilateral relations, quote, back to the right track of sound and steady development. The consensus was reached between Yang Jiechi, a member of the Politburo of the Communist Party of China Central Committee, and the U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. The two sides had a comprehensive and in-depth exchange of views on bilateral relations as well as international and regional issues of common concern. The meeting was described as, quote, constructive and conducive to enhancing mutual understanding. Yang from the Chinese side doubled down on China's position on many issues, including Taiwan, Hong Kong, and the South China Sea. And both sides agreed to properly manage their differences. Could this constructive meeting be taken as a sign of warming China-U.S. ties, or is it too early to reach that conclusion? Let's ask our panelists from China and the U.S. Joining me now from Memphis in the U.S., Joseph Mahoney, professor of politics with East China Normal University. In Beijing, Jia Jingguo, professor from the School of International Studies with Peking University. Professors, welcome to the program. Sounds encouraging, at least from the readouts from both sides, China and the U.S., and there is one concrete result, likely virtual meeting of the two leaders, China and the U.S., two presidents, before the end of the year. No concrete yet uh, result about the timing, about the content, and about uh, exactly what would make of that meeting. But to you, Professor Jia, what does that mean? Well, that's a, a sign that uh, we are uh, reaching a point uh, that both sides are worried about the trend of direction of development of the relationship. Uh, I think uh, it's time uh, both sides realize it's time to sit down and talk to each other uh -huh. and exchange views as to how to manage our differences and uh, at the same time try to work uh, together in areas of shared interests. Mm. Being termed as constructive and candid by both sides, also conducive, uh, what would this meeting uh, that they have been talking about during the uh, the senior level uh, lead, uh, senior level officials meeting about the two uh, presidents of the two countries, uh, Professor Mahoney? Well, you know, virtual face-to-face -face meetings are, are quite common in the COVID era. There, there have been many that both presidents have participated in with mm. uh, other organizations. So it's not that exceptional, but it, it is clear that this is intended as a positive step forward, but short of a normal summit. Now, uh, most of the meetings that have happened thus far, if we go back, uh, and I mean during the Biden administration, if we go back uh, to the Alaska meeting, uh, have, have not uh, really produced much uh, progress and, and and of course the the Alaska meeting was mm -hmm. was quite uh, testy. But usually we don't have we don't normally stage a meeting like this, a summit or even a virtual summit, unless uh, both sides feel like they can come out and say something right. uh, positive and 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 show some uh, progress. So let's hope that this is the case uh, for this virtual meeting. 
Uh, but, you know, I think uh, we should still be a little stoic and not get our hopes too high. Uh, we got footages, of course, of the Chinese delegation and the U.S. delegation in Zurich earlier. But, you know, you think about that. This is going to be, if being held before the end of the year, the very first direct uh, meeting, even though held virtually between the two presidents. Earlier, they have been meeting one another virtually on multilateral uh, platforms and also through phone calls, but no direct uh, formal meeting. So this is going to be really something. Before that, uh, Professor Jia, there's a lot of things taking place in the world. Uh, for example, COP16, COP26, G20 summit, uh, and the things goes on, uh, APEC uh, leaders meeting as well, uh, not to mention even more. Uh, so, Professor Jia, what would all of this mean leading up uh, to the eventual virtual conference uh, between the two sides? Well, uh, there are multilateral settings, yes. uh, but then uh, we are talking about bilateral meeting mm -hmm. uh, between the two uh, leaders. Uh, uh, so in the multilateral setting, you have a lot of people there. Uh, you don't, they don't talk to each other. Uh, uh, even when they do, it's very brief. Uh, so, but in the bilateral setting, then you have uh, two leaders talking to each other. Uh, depends on how long. Uh, I think it's uh, significant in this in the sense that uh, uh, you know the relationship mm. has been deteriorating, has been intense, and uh, uh, leaders, especially senior leaders, have not talked to each other uh, that often for the past a few years. So uh, it's uh, very important uh, for top leaders uh, right. of the two countries to talk to each other directly and uh, with some depth. Mm. I can see that both of you are trying your best to try to come up with some uh, sound analysis about what might be happening, even though there are so many unpredictabilities. One of it is how to define this relationship. Uh, uh, Mr. Yang Jiechi from the Chinese side, uh, in fact, uh, said very clearly he uh, poses uh, using competition as the nature of relations between China and the United States. Both sides also agreed that, that uh, they need to uh, really uh, properly manage their differences and also avoid uh, confrontation and the conflict. Now, Professor Mahoney, uh, how do you see all of these words, uh, which is likely to define the real nature of this relationship, which is, of course, still in transition? Well, you know, the problem here in part is that uh, the word competition, uh, which uh, feeds directly into the concept of great power competition, uh, uh, this concept is the norm in Washington now. And the problem with this is that it's too susceptible to China hawks, you know, people in the United States who, who really want to take a hard position against China, who believe that uh, great power competition equates with a new Cold War and, and really want to, to push towards that mm. in some awful sort of way. Now, in fact, competition is common everywhere. It's, it's in most aspects of our lives, not just international relations. And this is one of the reasons why we emphasize cooperation, you know, as a pushback against the more dominant culture of competition. If we instead focus on competition, if we always come back to that term, then it reduces the already relatively small space for cooperation, mm -hmm. but in a time when we need more cooperation, given a number of existential crises like the pandemic, yeah. like climate change, like the need to recover uh, economically on a global scale. So, Professor Jia, this is very interesting. You know, what the U.S. is trying to present and what in real essence uh, is Washington trying to do in terms of its relations with China. Very interesting. This meeting just took place. We also heard the latest news that the CIA just established a so-called China Center to deal with the ultimate uh, uh, competition and threat uh, from China. Uh, so we see different actions, uh, mixed uh, uh, signals coming out of Washington. Of course, it's also something they are discussing among themselves how to deal with China. Professor Jia, how do you see See, you know, using the nature uh, of uh, uh, these words, uh, competition, cooperation, conflicts, uh, and uh, uh, confrontation, uh, all of these words, uh, do, we, do we know that Washington has decided, or has Beijing really made up the mind about what Washington is trying to achieve? Well, uh, I think uh, from Washington's perspective, uh, 
they think that uh, competition uh, is uh, not a uh, confrontation, is not a uh, conflict uh, and war. Uh, competition, uh, you compete uh, and uh, you may succeed, yeah. uh, you, may, uh, you may not. But what about uh, China's view? It's like, a, it's like a game. But from the Chinese perspective, uh, uh, China thinks that uh, uh, competition is something like confrontation because uh, American uh, side does not emphasize uh, cooperation that much. And we don't even talk uh, in a pragmatic way with China for, for, for some time. So Chinese understanding of competition from the US side is uh, something more hostile than uh, Americans believe that right. the uh, competition should uh, mean. Also about the Biden administration, uh, right after it coming into power, uh, there has been different debates in China, Professor Jia, you are very much aware of that, uh, about how that administration is likely to handle China so different uh, possibly uh, from the earlier administration. But then later in action, uh, at least over the past few months, uh, China hasn't noticed that much difference until recently. So Professor Jia, how is China looking at the track record of Biden administration dealing with China leading up to now? And, and what does that mean for, uh, for the near future? Uh, you know, you have to look at the past in order to judge the, the future. Right. Um, yeah, uh, in terms of toughness, I think the Biden administration has, beca has been uh, like uh, Trump administration's uh, policy. But the content and uh, the, the, the purpose are quite different. Uh, and also, uh, uh, from the Chinese side, uh, you know, they look the same. Uh, but uh, from the U.S. side, uh, at least the Biden administration people believe it's very different. Uh, the reason for continuing toughness, uh, first, I think uh, the Biden administration uh, has ide ideological uh, problem with China, uh, more so than the Trump administration. Second, it faces a very bad political situation in the U.S. Um, uh, for at, at least for the Biden administration, uh, uh, it wants to do something uh, such as uh, appoint the cabinet members, uh, uh, you know, get the uh, bill passed uh, to revive the economy and fight the pandemic. Mm. But it has a very slim margin. Uh, in, in the Congress. So in order to get Congress uh, support, it has to uh, take a tough position because most of the people in the Congress uh, have uh, uh, are in that kind okay. of a state of mind. So uh, it's very difficult for it to change. But now I think uh, the they see the relationship is in a, in a terrible state and, and, and also uh, if not handled well, we may end up into a con military conflict and even war because of uh, uh, the situation in the South China Sea and Taiwan. Right. So they're worried. And the economy also, uh, you need a work. So, what does that mean China for China? I mean, uh, you know, it, it might be interesting to understand their actions in one way or another, but what does that mean for China? Very briefly from you, Professor Jia, before I move on to the next speaker. Well, China is uh, uh, has been uh, reaching out, actually, uh, especially in the initial period of the Biden administration, to the uh, U.S. side and try to be friendly and 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 seek cooperation. But uh -huh. then, it was uh, cold shouldered. Uh, so uh, I think uh, so. China, you know. It, uh, took this uh, uh, position of patience. So we wait until uh, okay. the moment. But All right. We, we don't know what's going to we'll happen. We probably have to wait to and see. Uh, Professor Mahoney, uh, since our time is very limited, uh, go to you also a question. So do you see the latest uh, apparent uh, warming up a little bit, at least in terms of communication between the two sides, particularly from Washington. Is it more a strategic shift or transition, or is it more a technical uh, shift because of domestic politics, because of you know the issue of Afghanistan, because of its 
hard uh, to uh, struggle even with its uh, own domestic agenda and also its relationship with its allies. Uh, we see the administration official now traveling around the world trying to persuade the allies and what they consider as partners of their positions. So, uh, Professor Mahoney, your thoughts? You know, I, all of those things are factors, uh, and, and I agree with my colleague at Beida, I agree with his assessment, but, you know, I've been searching for uh, an analogy that helps explain this, and increasingly it, it reminds me of an, of an old couple where one of, the, one, like one of the spouses has become increasingly erratic, you know, is saying, let's decouple, no, let's recouple, let's do business, let's not do business, let's be friends, or let me go try to get all of my friends to help me fight against you. <laughs> uh, I think this is really uh, the sort of thing that we're seeing now in the U.S.-China relationship. And I think it's, the, I think, you know, you know, this kind of relationship is either intentionally manipulative, you know, be, we keep uh, getting uh, the, the optimistic whenever the U.S. starts to show some responsibilities, starts to show something positive. We invest, we overinvest ourselves mm -hmm. in that emotionally and we sort of ignore all the incredible negative things that have happened over the last two or three years. So this is either being intentionally manipulative or, you know, Washington has simply lost its way or lost its mind because of all the complications all right. that, we're, that we're currently seeing. So, you know, I think that, that uh, Beijing is increasingly coming to this, this rather uh, sober position that they need to be, they don't need to invest themselves too emotionally, don't need, don't need to allow themselves to mm -hmm. be distracted too much. And, and here I recall the old idiom from uh, Deng Xiaoping, you know, crossing uh, the river uh, by feeling the stones. You know, this is really, I think, uh, the, the right uh, uh, sort of way of thinking about it now, that every step now is slippery. Uh, but if we, if we move cautiously, if we don't become too excited, if we don't allow ourselves to be sucked into Washington's craziness, then maybe we'll all make it safely across the river. Mm. Well, it takes a lot of uh, strength and also uh, skills to cross the river while filling the stones, whether the stones are cold or hot. Thank you so much, uh, both of you gentlemen, for joining us and giving us more insights in the latest development between China and the United States. Joseph Mahoney, Jia Xinguo, really appreciate it. Have a great evening, both of you. And you're watching World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Still to come in our program, the 2021 Nobel laureate for a study on human skin receptors for touch and temperature, the mentor of an eminent Chinese scholar, insights on the Nobel-winning research from Professor Xiao by Long, a biochemist at Tsinghua University, next. Welcome back. This is World Insight with me, Tian Wei. This year, Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine was awarded to two American scientists, David Julius and Ardem Papaputian, for their discoveries of skin receptors for temperature and touch. Papaputian was the mentor of Professor Xiao Bailong, a biochemist at Tsinghua University in Beijing and postdoctoral researcher in Papaputian's lab from 2007 to 2012. Xiao witnessed the Nobel-winning research work in Papaputian's lab. He also quickly followed up on his own discovery with related early studies. So what breakthroughs did Papaputian's team discover along the way? How will this research help humans, especially those with serious illness? Professor Xiao Bailong from Tsinghua University shared his insights with me. Take a listen. Now I'm joined by Bai Long Xiao, professor from the School of Pharmaceutical Sciences with Tsinghua University. Professor Xiao, what a pleasure to see you. Oh, it's a great pleasure to uh, meet you too. I know you're celebrating together with uh, the longtime professor you've been working with. Uh, what about this year? What a nice surprise, isn't it? Oh, yes, great. Yeah, actually, it's it was very exciting. Yeah, when I saw the news, I immediately send an email uh, congratulation to my previous supervisor, uh, Dr. Adam Padaputian, to congratulate him for this award. Mm -hmm. What is the significance really of him and also his counterpart winning this year's award? What does that mean in terms of recognition of the field of research? 
Yeah, I think it's very significant uh, because our ability to sense heat, cold, and touch is a very essential for survival and uh, undertaking our interaction with our environment, right? Uh, in our daily life, actually, we may take this sensation uh, in, for granted. For instance, if we would have today's interview in person, the first thing uh, we will do when we meet is to say hello and may shake hands. Mm -hmm. But have you ever given a thought how we feel the hand shaking? Yeah, then we may chat a bit about the weather, mm. right? Today, I'm in Beijing, so it's getting cooler. How about in Shanghai? Mm. Are you in Shanghai, right? I'm Am in I Beijing. Right? Oh, you're in Beijing too. Okay, so so you you must agree today is getting cooler. Absolutely. So, but do you know how we can feel different temperatures, yeah. heat or cold? So, but why do we need to make sense of the senses in a way? You know, for us, it's you know we take it for granted, right? We just feel there is coldness, there is warmth, there is. But, but but why do we need to make sense of it? Uh, by making sense of it, what are we achieving or aspire to achieve? Yeah, so maybe I'll answer this question in two ways. As a scientist, we are very curious how this occur. So for this, this question I think have been solved by this year's Nobel Prize laureate, Professor David Julius and Adam Patipodian. So David actually used a uh, chemical known as capsaicin. This may sound quite strange to you, but actually we, you may encounter every day in your, in your life as well, because capsaicin is a pungent compound from chili pepper. So that's from the spicy food. When you we eat uh, uh, chili pepper, you will feel, feel um, hot in your, in your mouth, right? So actually this, this kind of sensation is similar to when you accidentally take a hot water, so you'll feel hot and burning in your mouth. So what caused this kind of sensation? So they, David actually used this in the, in the ingredient from the chili pepper to identify the sensor in, the, in our nerve system, which penetrated and our skin, which can respond to the chemicals and give our this spicy food sensation. Right. So that, that means when, we, although scientists are trying to understand how we sense temperatures, after we did the discovery of the receptors, now we have relationship to now our probably uh, disease conditions. I see. Like now you can see why we can, how we can feel pain. In fact, you were working very closely with Adam in his lab when you were working as a postdoctoral uh, degree uh, researcher. Uh, tell me more about how you did your research at that time. What component of your research eventually fit into the overall achievement? And how were you working with Adam during that period of time? Yeah, it actually was very exciting. So now recall the, the period of time. I, in, I joined the Adam's lab in 2007 yeah. as a postdoc fellow. So when I joined his lab, actually his lab was also working on identifying uh, temperature sensors. So actually David uh, Julius identified the first temp sensor to be one mm -hmm. in 1997. So Adam's lab actually had independently identified several uh, temperature sensors, including uh, the sensor feel, uh, allows it to feel uh, cool. Mm. The, or cold, trip M8, and also others. And the, then in the field, P, uh, scientists are really keen what molecules allow us to feel pressure. The Adams, uh, Adam is also interested in this question. So he had recruited one postdoc from uh, France, it called Bertrand Coast. Like Bertrand had expertise in uh, electrophysiology because it's very difficult to study uh, the mechanical force. So in uh, in his essay, so he can uh, uh, apply for a mechanical force using a very tiny uh, micro pipette to poke the cell. You know, you, if you can imagine, you have a, a ball, right? Like yeah. a, a cell, then you poke the cell membrane that give a very tiny force to the cell. 
if the cell has a sensor, then you can open, and this sensor could is an ion channel. They allow ions to come into the cell. Then we can use the uh, equipment to record the tiny current. Mm. So that's what Bertrand's expertise. So after he joined uh, uh, Adam's lab, he take the task to try to identify the molecule underlying this, uh, this mechanical evoked currents. Yeah, so then he compared different, he, so first he identified different cell lines, try to identify those cell lines showing this, kind, this type, of, type of current. And then eventually he had one uh, cell line showing a mechanically activate uh, current. I see. Then he kind of uh, tried to get the expression profile, see what kind of genes are expressed in this uh, cell type. Hmm. And also he's because he's what looking about your for, work? I mean, yeah, so my work is just, uh, at that time I was still working on the uh, temperature sensor channel. Yeah. Then after uh, Bertrand identified the gene uh, using uh, the technique mm. called PID1 and PID2. So um, then the, the, the discovery was published in 2010 in Science. So when this gene is both necessary and sufficient to mediate this type of current in, when, uh, in, in cells. But from that study, there's an unanswered question. Well, that question is like this, because this gene encodes a very unique protein. You know protein, right? So cells need protein to uh, do their functions. Mm -hmm. So this protein is quite unique. We know some other ion channels like some channels can sense voltage, some channels can sense chemicals, but these uh, uh, piezo proteins do not resemble any known class of ion channels. Interesting. So this immediately gives us one uh, question need to answer. So where the piezo protein itself can form an ion channel? So with my expertise, I think, okay, I, whether I could purify this protein, and then we can reconstitute this protein into an artificial cell membrane. Then, in, under this reduced uh, uh, system, where the piezo protein can mediate currents, indeed, we found that piezo protein are sufficient to mediate currents by themselves. Right. So, based on this evidence, we conclude that piezo protein are the long sought after mechanical activated cation channels. So what is the next goal in terms of research in this direction? I mean, uh, when the Nobel Prize is being awarded to, to the two professors, of course, it's a huge recognition of the direction of research. So what's next? I think uh, we need, need, uh, really need to get understand how exactly these uh, molecules, these sensors, really can convert the mechanical force into uh, cell signaling. So this, uh, I think, is a very key question. Right now, we still do not have a fully understanding of this. And the second one, whether we could use this sensor or this molecule to develop a uh, drug to treat some related diseases. Mm. Yeah, for example, the piezo channel, uh, uh, some patients have mutations in piezo channels, which can cause them to have uh, disease phenotypes. For example, the piezo tube media or gentle touch sensation, and also our proprioception with the, uh, the sense of our own body. So for those patients without PH2 function, they could not touch well, and they also could not work well mm -hmm. because they cannot sense their own, their muscle strength, their skeleton position. Interesting. I hope uh, the best luck to you and your team. What is the relationship now, you know, between your research and you know, of those uh, professors that you've been working with, is it competition or is it more cooperation or everyone is working on their own way toward the same goal? Yeah, I think now we have a very good relationship uh, with Adam. So we communicate a lot and also about projects. Yeah, so, and also we have different uh, emphasis, emphasis on different uh, uh, aspect of the, uh, of the study. For example, his lab had uh, worked uh, many on the physiological roles of piezo channels and their disease uh, relationship. And for my lab, we major work on at the molecular level, try to understand how piezo channel really function 
at the molecular level, allowing them, allowing them to uh, sense force. And also we are trying to, as I just mentioned, trying to uh, screen, uh, chem identify chemicals to, uh, in hope to develop therapeutic therapeutic drugs in the future. There's a lot of discussion, Professor Xiao, in China about, you know, when is a Chinese scientist going to win the Nobel Prize? Of course, it's not the only prize in the world that's important. There are many other prizes that Chinese scientists won. I, I'm hopeful and very encouraged by our current uh, situation in China. So I, Bill, I came back to, I, I got my PhD in Canada and uh, did a postdoc in the United States. And then I uh, came back in, in Tsinghua in 2013. Over the last eight, eight years, I really see the uh, research in China has grown so quickly and so, uh, so fast. This is just unbelievable. I think that the, uh, with this kind of uh, trend, I, I think uh, we have, uh, we, in the future, we can make lots of major discoveries. Xiao Bailong. Professor from the School of uh, Pharmaceutical Sciences with Tsinghua University. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. <laughs> Professor Xiao also told me he's going to celebrate with a few beers. And he has been working with the Nobel laureates for the year 2021 in medicine and physiology. You're watching World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Coming up. A reckoning on the true cost in lives and limbs of America's longest 20-year war in Afghanistan. The brutal lessons of foreign military intervention, that's up for discussion next. Welcome back. You're still watching World Insight. I'm Tian Wei. 20 years ago, on October the 7th, 2001, the U.S. and its allies invaded Afghanistan and later installed a Washington-backed administration composed mostly of personalities educated in the U.S. and other Western countries. Justice for the 9-11 attacks on American soil was the pretext of the war. Studies estimate the total death toll at more than 176,000. At least 47,000 Afghan civilians that lost their lives. Probably the number is much bigger than that. The real number of Afghan deaths is likely much higher due to disease and hunger made worse with the conflict. Afghans suffered the most, bearing the brunt of the decades of violence. In August, the Taliban took control of Afghan capital, and then on August 30th, the U.S. withdrew its latest forces from Afghanistan, a chaotic end to the 20-year war. On Thursday, the Afghan interim government issued a statement on the 20th anniversary of the U.S. invasion of the country, saying the invasion brought nothing but misery to millions of Afghans. They said that the destiny of Afghanistan must be decided by the Afghan people. So how can Afghans recover from the pain of war? What is the state of the country now? How will they determine their own destiny if they really can? Let's ask our panelists. <music> 20 years anniversary of war in Afghanistan. We are joined in Washington, D.C. on the phone. Peter Kuzny, professor of history with American University in Beijing. We have Professor Li Guofu, who is the director of the Center for Middle East Studies at China Institute of International Studies. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Uh, professor Kuzny, uh, on the phone with us from Washington. Uh, tell me more about uh, this 20-year war. What does that mean for the U.S. rethinking of its strategy overseas? Briefly. The United States uh, has not really begun rethinking its, its strategy and its priorities. The focus is somewhere else right now. The United States is not good at learning the lessons of war. It took a long time to learn the lessons of Vietnam they were still never learned and, and now we've blundered into one war after another this war as you say is a humanitarian disaster disaster for the people of afghanistan a waste of trillions and trillions of dollars for the united states and the world and an example of why this kind of military interventions do not solve problems 
Mm-hmm. So I think that's the lesson that we have to learn from this. This is one the United States since World War II has gotten involved in one episode after another. Right. And you don't find well, human what, solutions through military means. Mm, there are broken voices. We try to catch up with you a bit later. But, you know, one of the things is uh, what about the state of the country right now in Afghanistan? Professor Lee here with us in the studio. Uh, the Taliban has yet to won any international recognition. So uh, how do you see this transition? What is likely uh, to be the status of this interim government and the country? I think since uh, now we have almost uh, two months since uh, Taliban totally and control the country and the set of uh, they call the uh, temporary and the government. And after Taliban took over the country so far, we can see that you know, some progress at least has been uh, made. And the country, you know, there's no war. I mean, the sizable or large war, including you know some you know the mm. resistance at the initial stage. But generally, you know, the country you know, keep quiet. And also, you can see, you know, the Taliban has changed its mission from a mountainary fighter, not to be a, a uniformed police to patrol, you right. know, the country or the capital in order to keep uh, quiet. Generally, I think you know, this is what we may call, you know, the some uh, positive developments. It's very uh, interesting to see this mixture. On the one hand, it seems that there is an apparent peace for most of the Afghans right now. Yeah. And but, things are going in a smooth direction, but a lot of people still worry so much because of the track record of the Taliban and because of the country's international status, Professor Lee. I think, you know, at the same time we say that, you know, we see some positive but also some uh, disappointing some developments, especially, you know, it's a treatment uh, to the female, especially the girls. They are not allowed the girls to, you know, go to, you know, the high school, they have sanked so far most of the female government employees, asked them back to home. And also, you know, some regulations have very yeah. strict, you know, with regard to the, the women's rights. Now, this is not, I mean, generally speaking, not in the right direction. And also, they have been, you know, not to keep what they have promised to the people. So no, this is uh, regarded one of the major you know, issue people are concerned with, you know, the current right. government's policies. Okay. Professor Kuznick, uh, let me try once again to you uh, about, you know, many are asking uh, what is likely uh, to be uh, this uh, strategy coming out of Afghanistan about uh, how is it going to work with the rest of the world while at the same time need to fight the war against the terrorism. Professor Kuznick, your take. Well, we're, we're waiting to see. The rest of the world has effectively cut off all foreign aid, waiting to see how the government performs. That is creating a, a further humanitarian disaster inside Afghanistan. The country was heavily dependent on outside aid to fund itself for the past 20 years. So maybe seven, 70 or 80 or 90 percent of the budget was coming from the outside of Afghanistan. That's been cut off. Mm-hmm. What we're seeing as a result is a lot of chaos, very heavy unemployment, right. refugees okay. both inside and outside the country, and uh, this Taliban coming in and without having a lot of recent history of governing, trying to put this together. And so it's a, an almost impossible situation. And the suffering inside of Afghanistan now is really uh, out of control. Mm-hmm. And so people don't have jobs. The banks are not giving, providing money, uh, and and uh, people in many places don't have housing. Even a, a 20 years of destruction. So I, I'm very worried about the situation in Afghanistan. One could argue now the situation is not necessarily worse, but uh, 
almost similar to the earlier 20 years. But uh, another question about the, against the terrorism, Professor Lee, we only have one minute left. Uh, uh, recently, we saw some uh, raids against the ISIS. Of course, we know the Taliban and the ISIS were traditionally enemies. But the, what does that say about really the determination from the Taliban against the terrorism, particularly terrorism that are still booming in the area, Professor? I think this is a very positive site. A reason though we have, uh, you know, to witness some uh, bombs, you know, caused by these uh, terrorist organizations, mm -hmm. which make, you know, the Taliban to determine, to terminate this uh, terrorist organization. I believe this is a positive side. But as we know, ISIS uh, uh, traditionally are the enemies of uh, the Taliban, but not necessarily the other groups that some consider as terrorist groups. Uh, so, Professor, how do you see, how do you see those issues? I think you know, this is the preconditions for not only the recognition of uh, Taliban legitimacy, but also you know, the aid international provided to Taliban. And uh, also Taliban has made a sort of a promise to the international communities. Right. So, so I believe step by step, you know, Taliban will take some measures against these terrorist organizations. We'll see how things would go from here. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Li Guofu and Professor Peter Kuznick uh, joining us from Beijing and Washington. You're watching World Inside. That's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more search World Inside or check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching. Bye for now. Thank you. Professor.